Thank you very much. Shall we put it just over the table like this? Can you tablecloth? A tablecloth. What a good idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our, our first hymn this morning is one that, when I chose it, I didn't realize that it was precious to somebody else as well. Great is thy faithfulness. It was precious to Ian Rao because he was in Nigeria as we were during the Civil War. He was on the losing side, we were on the winning side. And one night, he and other poor machinery men, all the women left, said, This is the night. You must go. You have to go in the, in the night through the Cameroons. And this they being told me that all the way along they stand this king. So let us sing it now. Grace is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning from thee. <laughs>
Now we come to our prayers of thanksgiving. And saying sorry for the things we've done or not done that have hurt us and other people in the world. So let us pray. Holy Father, we come with joy to worship you as we move from the summer days into autumn. We praise you for all you have given us. And though you are great and good, great and good God beyond anything you can imagine, we know that each one of us is loved by you, and that you are always with us, and that we are part of your worldwide family. For you are a God of love. Give us love, love in our thinking and our speaking, love in our doing, and in the hidden places of our souls. Love for our neighbours far and near. Love for those we find hard to bear, and those who find it hard to bear with us. Love in joy, love in songs, that our lives may be guided by your love. And Lord, we give you thanks for all those who have shown us your love loved us into the church and we thank you for the care given by this church to all who come here and we rejoice that your church is found in every land throughout the whole world and that we have much to learn from the generosity of the people and their vibrant worship in many many lands today Lord, we give thanks for the life that we have now for his life of love for you and for everyone we met. We also remember him, Lord, as a powerful preacher, a missionary, a truly man of God. <coughs> and we thank you for all the life family, for Anne, his wife, who was so generous, for his sister Eileen, also a missionary, and among the first batch of women ministers in the Methodist Church but also for Helen. His daughter, who died so young, who spent her life caring for others, especially refugees. We thank you, Lord, for the world we live in, for the beauties of nature and the seasons, the leaves turning from green to gold and to brown, with rain sometimes too constant, and the assurance of the coming of spring and spring flowers. So God, our God of love, most of all we thank you for sending Jesus your Son, who came to live as one of us, that we might enter a new relation for you, with you through his life and death, and that we are now empowered to help to bring your kingdom of love to this earth. And Lord, we thank you for those moments of glory when the veil between heaven and earth is lifted and we are at one with you. Sometimes when we are alone, but other times when we see your kingdom here on earth amidst your people. Yet though we love you, Lord, we so often forget you or turn away from you by our actions or our failure to act. We deny you, we hurt you, we hurt ourselves and we hurt others. We ask you to forgive us. Help us to begin each day by asking what we can do for you and that we may see your image in every single person we meet every day. We ask these prayers through Jesus who loved us and died for us. Amen. And now let us say the Lord's prayer, prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of time and deliver us for the kingdom, for the power, and the glory of our Lord, for our time of birth. Amen.
And now it is time for the children. You know, I think that grown-ups often listen harder to the children's story than sometimes the sermon. But I think children are very, very important. And this morning we're going to have a slideshow, but the story is going to be somebody who's been one of my heroes, I think, all my life. And his name was Martin Luther King. And so those people who heard of him. That's wonderful. That's a children. All right. Now we're going to stop with our first, our first slide. What's our first slide? Can you see all the children? There is Martin Luther in India, in Alabama, in Southern America. Right. The next slide, please. This is a woman saying to Martin, Martin, don't come here anymore. You can't play with my boys. Go home. And he was a very little boy. Only four of that, and he felt very, very sad. So he went home. And he said to his mother, what's gone wrong, Mom? I thought, I thought we were friends. And his mother explained to him that the laws in that part of America said black and white people must stay apart. Black children, can you imagine? How about the school with white children? Even in churches, they didn't mix. They couldn't eat in the same restaurants as white people. They couldn't even drink from the same water taps as white people. And Martin said, that's not fair. And in his little mind, when he was a little boy, he decided he would try and do something about that. And it stuck in his mind, and things, if you ask the grown-ups there, they will remember things that come to them when they're children. If something sticks in your mind, it is there forever. So, that's Carry on. Now, Martin's father was a Baptist minister. And people used to love to come to church to hear him, and they admired what he said. And Martin sat there, and he looked, he looked at his heart, and he thought, Do you know, perhaps one day, I might become a preacher. Even when he was little, I remember John Cook saying, a minister here long ago, he thought of being a preacher, and he was very, and he became one. Right? So Martin was at school and he was learning. He worked hard, he was probably quite clever, he worked hard, and that's actually more important than being clever. He wrote this book, his book, The Hat for Gandhi. I don't know if you know this, but The Hat for Gandhi in his life. No one knows she did that, or he met somebody who met him here. And he took people on peaceful marches because they wanted better lives. The people in India were not treated like at all. And he wanted them. So he used to drive marches and get everybody together and say, this is what we're doing. And that also stuck in, in Martin's mind. And he thought, that's not the way to do it. Is that the way to do it? As he decided he wanted to make very big changes. So we move on. And this is Martin, he did pick up a Baptist minister, and there's his wife with him, and he had four, he calls them little children, I don't know what they used to work. And that's his Baptist church in Alabama. So what is he going to say to his people in the church? See what happened. In that country, the black people had to move off the buses for white people. The black people had to sit at the front, and the white people at the back. When I lived in Pakistan, it used to be women at the front and men at the back. But I tell you, these laws are very fiercely put into place. But one day, Rosa Parks, as she is, sitting at the front of the bus, and they said, you, you go to the back of the bus. And did she say yes? She said, no, I won't. And they asked her again, she said, no, I won't. Off she went to jail. It's a lovely song, I'm not going to sing it, but I will sing it. And it goes like this If you miss me at the back of the bus, you can't find me nowhere, go on over to the courthouse. I'll be waiting there. That was very important in America. One woman should stand up to the laws and should go, go to 
the help to their own lessons. Loving Father, we pray for children everywhere, that they be loved and treated fairly, and for these children here with us this morning, that they learn more about you. Amen. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 to 9. The reading is headed to Pastor. <coughs> Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day, they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions <coughs> and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say? He haven't seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves? We have not noticed. Yet, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And you see the naked to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like a dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your fear. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. Here is our first reading. <coughs>
and so lay down, all the living creatures. Thrown the nest, 
We, John resigned his job teaching at the medical school here. And we went to Pakistan. I was very nervous about Pakistan, as you can imagine, not knowing much about Muslim culture. We went to the Al Khan Medical College in Karachi. And from there we went on to nine years in Atlanta, Malawi, where John taught in a brand new medical school. We've heard of barefoot doctors, but I don't know that we've heard of a medical school without a single building. That's what there were, and there were 18 students. 20 years later, when I was there a month ago with David Asson, I revisited the medical school. Loads of buildings and a hundred students every year. So from small beginnings, it had grown. When John was doing that, I taught in three very different schools in Malawi. I taught little ones, I love little ones, as you see. Okay. Infants, I taught special needs because I'm a special needs teacher. But then, now I won't say no when they gave me an interview, but by the time I left, somehow I'd said yes to an Asian school teaching English. I've never taught English. I was the only white person in the school. But I did my best. And recently, when I was at the cathedral and coming out, somebody came up to me and said, Mrs. Patrick, you taught me English. And I said, well, what are you doing now? And she said, I'm a lawyer. And I said, oh, it's good to have stories like that. Throughout my life, I've been challenged by these words, Jim Redfords, because it is a message of judgment. You cannot get away from that. Some people think, oh, it's about countries, or some things it's about us. I think it's, a, it's about me, and I, I can't escape it. The question is, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and welcome thee, or naked and clothe thee? When did we see thee sick or in prison and visit thee? And the king will answer, through me, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. And the real message, I believe, is that God lives and is found amongst the poor. You did it for me. Doing it for the least, we are doing it for God. God identifies with the poor. Sometimes when we have discussion on does have God's favourites, we can't really answer, but actually, I believe that the poor are God's favourites. Now, I loved all the countries I lived in, but Malawi, which is known as the Walmart of Africa, the poorest, I loved the most. And I've returned many, many times. And I've just returned from a wonderful trip there, and David, my eldest son, came to look after me. We stayed in a home for elderly Europeans. Now, that I know, I know. But that Hastings founder, and one of my friends, Clara Father, gave the graph, Hastings founder was concerned about what would happen to all old colonialists when they had people of living in the world. They wouldn't want to go home. Where could they be? And it is in the Constitution, it cannot be changed. And the Zimbabwe friend who would love to live there, but she can't. You have to be white and you have to live 20 years and be a citizen. Yes, you have to be the right to live forever there. That is a very good position. It is a very good position. I'm not, I'm not going to even enter into There's some things you can do and some things you can't. Anyway, we stayed in this home for elderly. Here it was run by the most godly author of Sandian monks, Sister E. I'll tell you, they were wonderful. And a missionary lent us a four by four car, which, which you need. It went, and we went to look lots of projects and the prison. So, my task this morning is really to try and answer these questions Lord, when did we see the hungry or thirsty or a stranger? or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to thee. This clearly is a story of judgment. First, when did we see you hungry? My most shattering experience was in Nigeria. I can hardly talk about it. Over 60 years ago, doctors had to work seven days a week and on Sunday night, John went to look at the children's ward. That's the children and the fire. There's so many children. The Lord was children and 
And then I accompanied him. And then I saw a tiny child in the last stages of starvation, Erasmus, that was as absolute misery, absolute misery. And I prayed for the child to die. It seems terrible to pray, but there was no hope. And when we sing this hymn across the world, across the street, the victims of injustice cry, but shut them for bread to eat and never forgive them until they die, I think of this child. He has been rained upon, especially the unfair side. My child was the same as this child that died. My child was sometimes accused of being, not difficult, overweight because he was a bonny boy and he didn't get bonny children in Nigeria whatsoever. And then another time, I was a special needs teacher and I was asked to follow up on some special needs ch ch children that were now adults in the villages. And so I went and did my best. And I said to one of them, how are you doing? Many of the children had died by the way. And I said, how are you doing? And she said, we eat every other way. We eat every other way. And another time when a woman begged me for the bed in her own village after burying her husband in the town where she could not afford to take him home for burial, <coughs> she was not only grieving, she was hungry. This was Malawi. So how can we possibly help? Malawi is one of the poorest countries in the world, ranked 153 out of 169 countries by the UN with a population of 13 million, and half of that living on less than a dollar a day. When we were there, AIDS was ravishing the country. The Ministry of Health died of AIDS. It was just right across the board, and every week we had lists of funerals for people about AIDS, by the way, the word AIDS was never mentioned. Malawi remains a donor-dependent country, and in Fred again, it was devastated by Hurricane Freddy. There are many different groups trying to do their best for Malawi. Medicines on Frontier, Save the Children Fund, Oxfam, and dozens of local charities. This is what Oxfam says. We try to help create a Malawi where Malawian women, men, girls, and boys are more equal by improved livelihoods and as active citizens can influence the decisions that affect their lives. And now we can have a look at the picture. One of the things that it does really well is bananas. You buy a banana plant for a pound, within a year it will grow. This is me visiting a, a, somebody that we were supporting. Look at those bananas. And bananas sell very well. Never plant tomatoes. Tomatoes will grow by the millions, but people can't keep them. But bananas will keep. So that's one possibility. Another problem with Malawi is it has little forests. It has few exports. Do you know what the main export of Malawi was by far? Have you said? Tobacco. Sadly, many people speak of corruption in the government, and that times were better under Kamuzu Banda, an enlightened dictator. It is very hard for us Europeans to understand that when you go from poverty to riches, as some people do in government, it is very hard for them not to hang on to that, they're not going to give it up. I'm, I'm not justifying it, but I'm saying there are different ways of, of looking at things. And I know from my own experience how it's almost impossible to reach the poorest people. Go reach those people that say, come and help me. Or somebody was helping me, I said, where did you meet that woman we're helping today? So oh, I said, oh, I'm to It is very difficult. And my conclusion is, don't do what I did. Do personal things, even when you trust everybody like did. Use an organisation, because they can look at it much better and see a longer term view. And yet, in this very poor country, this is what I learned to laugh. And sometimes after they give me loads of parties, I have wonderful parties, sometimes you just have to go and lie down afterwards because you've laughed yourself silly. It is a very happy place. 
And if you're in an airplane and you're getting hit to laugh, you can tell there's been a people laughing. You don't hear that in an airplane, it's coming to Britain, I'm sorry to tell you. The next question is, when did we see people in prison? John was the founder, visited prison in Oxford when he was a student, and we have a lot of history of prison visiting. Do you remember Peter Bush? He worshipped here in preached. He was a prison chaplain. And then there was Richard Harrison, who was a minister at Grangewood. He and his wife went to death row to visit some of them. And they spent a lot of time visiting people in prison. I heard this morning on the radio, there's a, a program this afternoon on the radio about death row. And recently, when I was preaching at Kingswood, I asked three people to bring something to show us what they did for God. Irene Bostock held up some jangling keys and asked Everest what? Well, first of all said, it's your house, no. It's the church, no. It's your sisters, no. And it went on and on. And nobody guessed. Anybody here guess? It's a prison keys. She has been a prison visitor for many, many, many years. And that's what she was showing us. That was the word of God. Now, when I lived in Malawi, not long before I left, I heard an English man who was in prison. That, that's rare. Uh, not that we're better than others, but there's not many English people about. And I continued to visit him for 18 months till I left. And I visited him every other day, taking either books and food, because he was gay. It is illegal still in Nigeria, in, in Malawi, to be gay. The European, he was being a teacher at the high school, nobody would have anything to do with him. Even the priest, who I asked, wouldn't visit. At that stage, there were about a, a thousand people, and there were beds for very few. You are locked up at four in the afternoon, you have one meal in the day. When I went back this year, it was doubled. There were 2,000. And Mr. Anapcat, who I told his son, he was a Hindu and spent two million pounds. Because Christians must never feel we're the only people doing good. He'd given two million pounds to build residential lots for some of the inmates. It would be probably about 600 out of 2,000. But they're still locked up every day at four. They still get one meal a day. I visited three times. And the prison officer uh, uh, said to me that mo many of them are waiting trial and they were doing the best they could. Now I'm going to ask for a picture. Uh, that, that, yes. So I said, what can I do? <laughs> it's nothing really. He can't do anything to do with that. He said, go to the people that are down and the old people and give them soap. There is no soap in the house. And where is my piece of soap? Here it is. That's my piece from this year. And that's from years ago. I still kept them on. So um, we went with David at the door. And he said, get some sort of brushes and sort of paste. And so that's what we did. It was, it was nothing. But it, it was something. And we had a wonderful meeting with the, the prisoners who gathered like a few of and for me to talk to them, it was very moving. It was, and I had to be translated. They had to be translated. I think it was that somebody has some care for you. And actually, the prison. How can I put it? The conditions were terrible. The prison conditions were really terrible. Um, that's me outside the prison. But the atmosphere was not terrible. I've been many times, I've walked around with a prison officer, I never had any, any, <coughs> any difficulty, any difficulty whatsoever, and people really very, very, very kind to me. Um, yes, the, go the government gives the prisoner, prison 20 cents a day to feed the prisoners. It's a very important thing. But still, it was not the atmosphere of living that we had. And this is another odd story. The warden of the cathedral was successful in promoting a project that money goes on trees. He
he went off to some of the prison. Nobody said a word against him. I'm not saying they should, but they didn't judge. We women all raced to his house to sit with his wife and pray with his wife. And then we arranged to go to Zomba Prison's high security. Unfortunately, the transport never turned up. But the, the point was there is not an atmosphere of blame. And I have to say, I was then asked to replace the warden as the warden of the cathedral. I was not even an Anglican, <coughs> but that didn't matter, <coughs> matter to them. And I come to the last picture now, please. That one. Recently, I did go to look at a lot of projects. I mean, it was a, well, not a lot, but several. And they, I was a stranger. I've always been a stranger. They've never met me before. Their kindness to me, the hugs, the hugs I got from the women were wonderful. And here they are. They, I mean, those are tomatoes. And there are lots of other things and bananas they gave to me, and I was a stranger. I found out also when I went to Ethiopia and certainly in um, in Pakistan, I would be sat down to eat, and they would have a stand and watch because they couldn't afford to feed themselves. In one place, there were only chicken was killed to feed us. I think Connie and was Connie. Connie and I were in Ethiopia together, so a considerable time ago now. But they were so generous. And so I, finally I found the answer to the questions, Lord, when did we see the hungry, the evil, or thirsty, and give thee drink? When did we see the stranger? When did we see, see the imprisoned? Truly I say to you, doing it for the least of these men that you do it for me. And God is to be found in the poorest of people. I also found it in the life of a remarkable man, Father Lewis, in Karachi, the leader of the Aramisistan community where we worship with the Franciscans. He refused to have a car, he had a tiny moped, he risked going on demonstrations, which is very dangerous. If he came to supper, we had to give him small portions, and obviously we had to give it for ourselves as well. Um, and once I took a fillet of beef to some nuns, what a mistake. They looked at it, I thought it would be a treat. He said, Janet, we have chosen to live like this. We have to go this and that mount. Father Lewis worked in the Kachibabis, the shanty towns of Karachi. I worked, I worked with him. Teaching children with learning difficulties. He was, I saw him very angry once because somebody had given his brothers a lot of money to distribute and he said, they will think we're like the rich. And when I had to leave Karachi, I was very sad and I went to him and he said to me, Janet, why do you think God is only your hands? God has many hands. And so it was. The Methodist Church, if I can just see, like here it is, sent or sent money for somebody to finish my work, which I was doing on a little book, learning is fun. It was in the shanty towns, how to run a cake. The back is an old joke and the front is an English. But I learned then God has many hands, and Janet shows us only one little tiny bit. So I would just say thank you, Mother Nicholas. We never knew it. You changed and enriched my life. Thanks to me, to God, thanks be to God for the poor who have so much to teach us. Amen. Now we're going to see the next hymn, which is 672, or where can we where can we find you, Lord Jesus our Master? We want to serve you to answer your call. <coughs>
our prayers and needs. God enables you love and who calls us to be peacemakers. We pray this morning for peace in this very night. The whole world is aware of the extremely dire situation in Gaza. Can you pray for Israel and others to send humanitarian aid? The war and basic services to be resumed. Above all, Lord, we pray for a swift end to this terrible war. Lord, you know how long this conflict has already lasted for so many years. We ask that the leaders of the nations will not join in the war, but support peace negotiations. For this situation to be turned around and you to resolve this long standing issue. We pray that we begin for all suffering in Gaza and this world. But we also pray for those suffering in many conflicts throughout the world, for those who flee their homes, often never to return. We pray for those who manufacture arms, they turn their arms into casualties. Lord, we also pray for an end to the war in the Ukraine. And we pray for ourselves that we work and pray for peace and respond to appeals for aid. Above all, we pray for a swift end to this war. Loving God, we know you are God who calls on all people to be peacemakers. We pray for peace. And today, using our Methodist prayer, we pray with Christians in the Pacific and Britain. We give thanks for 200 years of Methodism in New Zealand. A complex country with services delivered in many languages, with a mix of cultures and worship styles. God of the whole church, bless the work of the church in all its diversity. And Lord, we pray for our front servant, our front body servant. We pray for our new ministers, that we welcome them and love them. And we pray for Arnold Dixon, one minister's woman. Issues will be resolved. We thank you for our, for our church. We pray for this community. We pray for those facing difficulties that they can't afford to. But the life crisis of many is, is not for the people of unhappy and not able to work. We thank you for the warm places that church has gathered to produce us. We think of people known to us who are in great difficulties. Let us in silence remember them before God. I mean, Lord, we pray for ourselves. You know us intimately. There's nothing that is hidden from you, and yet you still love us. We ask that we will love others as you love us. We ask you to forgive our shortcomings and help us each day to live free. We ask these prayers through Jesus, our friend and our redeemer. Amen. And now we will have the offer to. We have it. Ah. Yes. Gracious God, accept these gifts and within our lives to be used in your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <coughs> and last year is 679. We're using the Trinity Parliament to it. Come build the church, not eat the stone. 679. <laughs>
to do your will. We give you our feet to walk in your way. We give you our eyes to see the world as we see it. We give you our tongues to speak your kindness. And we give you ourselves that you may live and reign in us. Let us now say the first to you. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us.